So please stand as you are able for our first hymn, which is number 309. And I heard a rumor during choir that we don't know this one. So I'm going to help you learn it a little bit before we sing it. So I will let everyone get to 309 in this book. And Sherry is going to play it through just piano once. And then we're all going to go through the first verse together once. And then we will begin again at verse 1 um, and go through verses 1 through 4 and then 6. And just a note, 6 is printed down here. And if you look at this, I think I failed hymns for congregations this morning, but it's a lovely hymn. Um, when you get to, to after verse 1, you'll see that... The words go over here with each verse to the second verse, the second ending. Don't worry about that. Just follow the words all the way to the end, and we'll all be singing the right words at the right time or not, but we will all be making a beautiful noise to the Lord, and that's what matters. All right.
Do you guys like it when it's above 100 or under 100 degrees? Anyone like it over 100 degrees? You do? Yeah. <laughs> you can't go outside when it's over 100. That's probably wise. So, today I want to talk about what a member means. And that's a word we have in the church. Have you ever heard in the church about being a member? Yeah. What does that mean? You come here mostly every Sunday. Yep, that's that. That is my definition of being a member. Do you have an idea of a member, Julieta? What? Yes. Um, coming on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. So in the church, long, long time ago, people used to join the church. They still join the church, but it has its roots in people studying for. Weeks and weeks and weeks before Easter on what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to be part of a community and what the community will do and then what we will do for the community and how we can all be community together and then that person says, yeah, I want to do that. And they joined on Easter because Easter is our celebration of new life and new people coming. Today, when someone comes to me and says, I would like to join the church, I go, yay, welcome. And sometimes they are people who have been coming for a long time, and sometimes they're not. But it's making the same commitment, and then they've fought through the same things, and we like to make sure they know who we are as United Church of Christ, and who we are as Pilgrim Church, and what we believe in and stand for, and we say, join us. And today someone's going to join us, and I'm really excited. But I wanted to talk to you. Do you think, what do you think Jesus said about being a member or belonging? See, I think that's a better word, belonging. What did Jesus say about who belongs? Yeah. Everybody, everybody belongs. Everybody belongs, that's right. What do you think, Juliana? What did Jesus say? Everybody belongs. Everybody belongs. That's right. Jesus said that everybody belongs. And some people make a special promise to everyone. And some people show that special promise in their actions. And some people show their special promise in their prayers. And some people show their special promise the way they live in their hearts, making sure that everyone belongs. And does, does everyone mean that like some people who just don't believe kind of the same thing we do about certain things, and it means everyone except that. What do you think Jesus would say to that? Jesus would still welcome them. Jesus would still welcome them. I think you are right. Yes. Jesus what? Oh, yes. I think that's what Jesus means by loving our neighbors. And that's what Jesus means by welcoming whoever you meet. And that's what Jesus means by joining and being part of a community. What are some of the communities you are part of? You're part of this community. What are some of the community? What is a community? Yeah. It's a group of people that work together. A group of people that work together. Perfect. What are some of the communities you guys belong to? School is a community. And a church community. Church community. And family community. And family community. What about camp? Does, are any of you going to camp this summer? Yeah, is that a community? Kinda, yeah. And sometimes the cousins are a community. Yes. Camping. Camping is a community. So we all belong to a lot of different communities. And one way that we can help Jesus is to make sure that we are welcoming and we make sure everyone knows that they belong and we can be confident that we belong too because Jesus wants us to love ourselves because we are all made beautifully in the image of God just as we are. And I want you to look around this community, this room right now, 
because this is a community of people who are here to remind you of just that, that you are loved just as you are. Amen. So we do not have Sunday school today, but we do have some pages. Would you like to take my two brothers? Thank you. We are going to have crayons for you guys. And we have crayons in there. And I think we have crayons. All right. So we have now come to the time in our service where we lift up those things that we celebrate and those things that are heavy on our hearts together in here. And here we start with our joys. Are there any joys to celebrate today? Yes, Alex. Today is Amira's Sweet 16. Ooh. Happy birthday. <laughs> oh, we will all wish her a happy birthday this evening. Amazing. Any other joys to share today? Yes, I have. I realized uh, last Sunday that there's something that I wanted to joyously share personally because it is personal for me and I am so happy and thankful and enjoying having a choir. And I think it's so wonderful for, and don't, uh, you know, oh, we're small. It doesn't make much difference. Oh my. <laughs> it is the voice of God for us. And we all wish that we could be as melodious and faithful and good as you are to work. And then I stopped. Oh my goodness. That statement includes everyone that comes and gives a part of their time and their life in supporting the church in a certain way. And I thank all of you <laughs> that work. It's works of joy, and it certainly is uh, appreciated by me, and I wanted you to know that. <laughs> thank you, Pat. Thank you for that, joy. Thank you, choir. And Pat, thank you for the reminder that all God's children got a place in the choir. And we are a choir of sorts as a community as we join our voices together in praise. Thank you so much. Any other joys this morning? Are there any concerns this morning? Any sorrows you would like to share? Yes, I am. I stopped by Sue Asbills this morning <clears throat> on the way to church because whenever she eats things from Trader Joe's, she lets me know when I buy them and deliver them. And I hope you will all keep her in your prayers. She's in a lot of pain with her back. And so now she's looking at going back to Stanford. But she's just, and Sue's not one to complain, you know, so I know it must be awful. Thank you. We continue to pray for Sue and for the pain in her back. Maybe some calls. Yeah, if anyone feels like calling and say, hey, we can have you. Any other concerns this morning? Yes. I'd like to pray for being another brother that we should go on yesterday or the day before. And so we need prayers for her healing. Prayers for Dean's granddaughter, Gabby, who broke yes. her arm. Oh. We need prayers for healing. Yes. We pray for our best. Um, 
I have sent on the prayer chain a message about Roy Price. Roy and Linda Price have not been coming because of COVID, but Roy had a fall and broke his ankle. And it was such a severe break that he had to have surgery. So he was in Shasta Regional and he was diagnosed positive for COVID. So he was moved to an isolation room there. What he needs is to have physical therapy and he needs to be in a rehab position or place. So Friday he was moved to Copper Ridge and there he has an isolated room and he can still be there even though he is still testing positive. And, and Linda can go see him providing she is gowned up, so that helps. Now the, the surgeon said that he cannot put weight on his foot for six to eight weeks. Now just imagine that. So that's why they are really working with him, the physical therapists are, to give him strength so that she can move around. He can't use crutches yet, but he's, anyway, he's at Copper Ridge. And if you have time, you could send him a card or call Linda, and they would appreciate your concerns. Thank you. Thank you. So we pray for the prices, for healing and for Linda and for caretaking and for the struggle that is watching someone recovering from COVID. I'm, I'm thankful that she can visit him, though. That's relatively new as far as I know. Contact is good for healing. Any other concerns this morning? So this is not really a concern, but I'm going to toss it in anyway. I want to thank you all for uh, your prayers and your thoughts and your calls and your emails and your cards. Uh, yesterday, well, not yesterday, this week I buzzed down to Southern California for my month checkup and was proclaimed, everything looks good, and I lost my excuse to not lift things, <laughs> which is a good thing, I guess. Not when you're in the middle of a move, though, and you can say, hey, can you lift that box for me? Um, so, but I am really thankful, and I'm thankful for this place and the support of this place and all of you. So let us lift all of these things up to the one who knows what we need before we ask it. God, we know that you are a God of love and support and abundance and empowerment and liberation. Help us to remember this. Help us to see this in the windows of grace and mercy that we experience through healings, through support systems, through our communities, through those glimpses that we see in the midst of what feels like chaos, violence, a world out of control. Help us to know in the midst of this, your grace is those moments, is those communities is those glimpses as we come together and lift up all of those who are suffering, all of those who are ill, all of those who are caretakers, all of those who face difficult life decisions, who are in pain, all of those who are hungry, who are vulnerable, who are in despair, who are grieving, who are angry, who are seeking what to do and aren't sure where to go. You are not alone. The love of God is with you and in you and in your actions. And we remember that everything we do, ever so small in our own hearts and minds, with our own hands, that furthers your desire for justice and love and shalom transforms the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
morning is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Then an expert on the law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to get life forever? Jesus said, What is written in the law? What do you read there? The man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Also, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus said to him, Your answer is right. Do this, and you will live. But the man, wanting to show the importance of his question, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, as a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, some robbers attacked him. They tore off his clothes, beat him, and left him lying there, almost dead. It happened that a Jewish priest was going down that road. When he saw the man, he walked by on the other side. Next, a Levite came there, and after he went over and looked at the man, he walked by on the other side of the road. Then a Samaritan traveling down the road, came to where the hurt man was. When he saw the man, he felt very sorry for him. The Samaritan went to him, poured olive oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the hurt man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he cared for him. The next day, the Samaritan brought out two coins, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of this man. If you spend more money on him, I will pay it back to you when I come again. Then Jesus said, Which one of these three men do you think was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the robbers? The expert on the law answered, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Then go and do what he did.
So this passage from Luke this morning has a lot in it to unpack. We have eternal life, we have love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. And then we have this story to help us answer the question that I'm going to tackle this morning, who is my neighbor? Where a man is beset by thieves and left to kind of to die on the side of the road, and three people go by, two of them, the very people one might expect to help him, and the one not expected to help him picks him up, tends him, takes him to an inn, and pays for his care and his ongoing recovery. The one who showed mercy. So here we have again Jesus teaching, and here we have again the young lawyer, uh, a young expert in the law, coming to sort of, I think the, the, the point is not to ask a question like, hey, how do you have eternal life? It's, how do you have eternal life as a test? To see if Jesus answers correctly. Jesus turns it back on the person, and the person apparently answers correctly. And to push it, he says, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? I think for me, this feels more and more kind of like a loaded question. Who is my neighbor? So I'm going to share with you a post on Facebook that really grabbed me a few years ago. More than a few years ago, I think it's from 2016. But it was a post that a friend shared in the midst of Black Lives Matter marches and right after a sniper had shot at police in Dallas attempting to use a Black Lives Matter march as a cover. And this almost worked. And since then, I'm afraid there have been more killings by police and of black folks and ongoing movements to hold them accountable and to rehaul, not just reform, our policing system. And there are continued abuses at our border by Border Patrol agents, a reversal of a pregnant person's bodily autonomy, further assault on the agency trying to minimize the assault on our on the earth, more mass shootings at schools and malls and parades, more careful dismantling of rights that we hold dear, and more entrenchment, and at this point you're probably wondering why you came here this morning for a bit of good news, but I promise it's coming. In many ways it seems to me as if the more we accept the need for consciousness raising and waking up and lancing and purging the things that hold us back from being who we claim to be, the more the system digs in. So the question presented to me, to us, to Jesus, and all of us today, who is my neighbor, seems to have an urgency we might not have noticed before. And this post might give a glimpse into an answer. I don't know the person who posted it personally, but it is a status update from a black woman named Natasha Howell. And remember, this was in 2016, but I think her post rings true today. Natasha, Natasha Howell, smiley face, feeling hopeful. And these are her words. So this morning I went into a convenience store to get a protein bar. As I walked through the door, I noticed that there were two police, white police officers, one about my age and the other several years older, talking to the clerk an older white woman behind the counter about the shootings that have gone on, and this is in Dallas <clears throat> and around the country too, in the last past few days. They all looked at me and fell silent. I went about my business to get what I was looking for. As I turned back up the aisle to pay, the oldest officer was standing at the top of the aisle watching me. As I got closer, he asked me, how was I doing? I replied, okay, and you? And he looked at me with a strange look and he asked me, how are you really doing? I looked at him and said, I'm tired. His reply was, me too. Then he said, 
I guess it's not easy being either of us right now, is it? And I said, no, it's not. Then he hugged me and I cried. I had never seen that man before in my life. I have no idea why he was moved to talk to me. What I do know is that he and I shared a moment this morning that was absolutely beautiful. No judgments, no justifications, just two people sharing a moment. Hashtag friend, a moment of clarity. End of quote. So in a moment, in a convenience store, the kingdom of God appeared in an unexpected way. Why? Because both Natasha Howell and the police officer embodied the ethic of loving self, loving neighbor, loving God, in allowing this interaction to transcend the ego. That's loving God, is when we transcend the, the ego part of ourselves that needs power. In that moment, I can imagine that both Natasha Howell and the unnamed police officer felt they had just awoken in a strange inn, battered and bruised, disoriented, and wondering who was fitting the bill for their survival. Or perhaps each regarded each other as a stranger wounded in a ditch and chose to kneel down and tend the wounds. In this moment, the quality of mercy enters through a back door. And these two people answered the question, who is my neighbor? The one to whom I can simply ask, how are you? And accept the answer. And know that it's not my job to fix or explain and simply say, yeah, I'm tired too and begin there on the common ground of that. Who is my neighbor? A friend of mine often tweets about the safety of her big black body, and yes, she has, I, she has, I have permission to talk about that. She says, people confuse my education, family background with privilege, ignoring the fact that those only make me equal but not free. That phrase has struck me for a long time, equal but not free. We talk a lot about equality and freedom as if they're the same thing, but in a way they're not. We can be equal without everybody being free. To be, to exist, to have their voices heard. There are many of us who stand in different but similar intersections of privilege and vulnerability, in some cases in danger. We are equal, but we are not free. We are not free because something of our particularly created self makes us unsafe in comparison to the normative story about who and what is valued. Many of us remain silent because we have enough layers of privilege to do so. But as Audre Lorde wrote, your silence will not protect you. And my friend expounds on that a little bit. She says, when silence is a witness, it is a shameful witness, yet self-righteous in its denial of collusion. So what I get from that is that I can't be silent. But I also can't tell anyone whose intersection of oppression is one that I don't experience, how to respond to that experience. I can examine the intersections of the identities of which I am a part, and of which I am not a part, and go from there. I can continue to learn in the ever-emerging landscape of voices who will not be silenced anymore, around what identity is, what experience is, and about shredding our persistent collective myths about which of these is valued and heard. I don't always feel like I know what I can do. Because silence is indifference, I can't be silent. I can't do that. I can ask, how are you? And listen. I can put my body and safety in front lines that I am able to avoid through my own privilege. 
I can create space for the discomfort that arises when the shift happens. It must happen. Yes, this is uncomfortable. Keep going. We are gathered together. You have support. How can I speak to the people who will listen more closely to me about what needs to happen and how? I can do my best to reach across divides calmly and authentically, to embrace a different reality without appropriating or denying the experience of another, and that is the love with which we love our neighbor. And my dear ones, I tell you today that only, 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 the only way we can get through this is to love ourselves and love our neighbor and love God. We must have enough love to crouch down and touch the thing in the ditch that might give us pause, that might disgust us, but that desperately needs us to pick it up and tend it. We must recognize that the kingdom of God breaks through into the world when we do what is not expected, when we refuse to draw the lines demanded of us by pundits and politicians and the media, when we write our own narrative about it, Black lives matter, police officers' lives matter, women's lives matter, men's lives matter, non-binary lives matter, my life matters and your life matters, but we are all trapped in a spiral of cultural norms that weights some lives above others. We are trapped in a pattern of collectively breaking out of those norms just a tiny bit, only to have those who benefit from those norms shove us into them once again. Jesus warned the young lawyer that that is not the path of eternal life. Do not fall prey to the cultural norm that some voices are naturally more trustworthy, that the absence of disturbance is nonviolent, that one experience is the norm and others are to be questioned. When people talk to you about how they are experiencing the events of the world, listen. But do not tell them how to feel or how to respond. Reach out. Ask how people are doing. I cannot tell you how far that simple question, how are you, followed by listening presence, goes. It goes miles and miles. Don't give advice, but do be present. And don't be silent. So how will we be loved in this broken world? There are, all, are and always have been networks mobilized to assure access to health care. We must add our resources to them. There is an ongoing and continued pressure born, I will say, of Black Lives Matter activists to reform policing, to bring it to its studs and rebuild the way we do things. Right here in Reading, an example of community policing, a car that goes to support certain calls that may need a trained psychologist or other kinds of social services, and it's a start. There's so much grassroots, urban farming, native water protectors are still out there fighting for a right to clean water. There's a committee seeking accountability for domestic terrorism. Small moments abound everywhere. We just need to find the connective tissue. They are there in our community and beyond. They, these small moments that operate within the scope of mercy for our neighbors. Today I have to admit that while I was scrolling mindlessly for a moment on my phone, I got, um, I get updates from um, Michael Moore, the guy that did Roger and Me years ago, and um, is kind of an activist, and he apparently went before Congress recently and presented them with an amendment to replace the Second Amendment. <laughs> um, I encourage you to find that and read it. Maybe I can post it if people are interested. But that gives me hope. Someone who's willing to say, hey, this needs fixing. Let's eradicate this one and replace it for something, something for today, to address what's happening today and just go and say, here you go, discuss, vote on this. I'll do the work for you. And 
And I think it's exa an example, too, of a way that a white, straight, male, cisgendered guy can use his privilege by going to people who will listen to him more than they might listen to me or some other people in this room and say, here, this is our reality. Do something about it. We will remain broken in the ditch for as long as we refuse to lance and restructure the norms that still breed violence and bigotry that silence and disempower. Doing nothing and continuing to gaslight the experience of those we do not understand is the worst kind of silence. The only way to purge fear is to eradicate silence because it is within silence that fear hides. And fear and love are never roommates. It is only with hearts of love that we can transform our words and our actions to produce illumination that will show the way forward. Together we can find the courage to lance those wounds and disinfect them and bind them and heal them simply by saying, how are you today? And listen, and yep, I'm tired. I mean, honestly, moving away from the script, I'm tired. Raise your hand if you're tired. Yeah. But we can sit in that together and say, yep, so am I. It's not easy being green. It's not easy being these days. But we can acknowledge that and we can hug and create a moment for the kingdom of God to exist in that heartbeat. And with more and more of those moments, perhaps trust can grow and we can sit down and one person can say, hey, right here is where we have gone wrong. And then someone can say, we sure have, and right there is where we can do better. And we have to admit that we can do better, or we will remain the same. And my friend Mark summed it up well. He said, stop hating. Listen. Think outside your box, please. Hashtag peace. So I have a, a joke where I say, I have two holy writs. Should I say this from the pulpit? <laughs> I have two holy writs, I do. One is, is what we call the Bible, made up of um, the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, and the Christian Testament. And one would be the complete works of William Shakespeare. So I'm going to quote from that second one right now, from the Merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained. It dropped as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne and mark the monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above the scepter's sway. It is enthroned in the heart of kings. It is an attribute to God herself. And earthly power doth then show like as God's when mercy seasons justice. So which one of these was this person's neighbor? The one who showed mercy. Go now and do likewise. Listening, thinking outside your box. Please. Peace. 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 Amen. Amen. Our hymn, please stand as you're able for our hymn, which is Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love, which is number 498. We're going to do verses 2 and 3.
worlds. So today I am extremely thrilled because Catherine Hummock, has, uh, Kate, has elected to join us this morning. Um, and so I call you forward, Kate. What's my script? Got, oh, she's got her script. I expect nothing else from Kate, who has, who in my experience has shown herself to be intelligent and thoughtful, compassionate, inquisitive. <laughs> Um, do you, would you like to introduce yourself, Kate? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words, and then I will invite you to introduce yourself. So you may have noticed an extra little candle on our altar this morning. This candle re represents the light that is in Kate that she brings to us this morning to join with ours. And we have lit it as a symbol of your willingness to bring that light and what lights you up into our community, so that you may share it generously with us. So, people of Pilgrim Congreg Congregational United Church of Christ, I introduce you to our new sister in Christ, Catherine Cummer, who will be joining us in membership today. Thank you. I, I love this church, but it's a little scared because I've sat in so many churches where I just sat, and I wonder what like, well, this is a nice service, but what am I supposed to be doing out in the world? So thank you all. Um, I actually was raised on a farm in Colorado with uh, three siblings <coughs> and a Baptist family. Bless their hearts. I, I love them. Um, I had a Baptist grandfather, a Baptist Southern Baptist grandfather, and his oldest son was a Southern Baptist preacher, and his son was a Southern Baptist preacher, <laughs> etc. But I went to Baptist College in Missouri, and I got a BA in English, and I gave away my collective works of Shakespeare when I had to move up here. Yes. I it's had, a big bomb. I had a thousand books, and I had got here with 33. It was a terrible deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> Please hold the mic up higher. We, we really had to downsize. Oh, there thank you. you. There you I, go. Um, I had to get rid of about three quarters of the things I owned. <laughs> Square ends, clothes, uh, computers, things went in the dumpster, actually, sometimes, but you didn't have that all the time. But I um, I think I, I miss community. I miss companionship. And the first thing Megan said to the children when the first service I was here was, be not afraid. And I thought, wow, there's a sermon right there. So I hope I can uh, be not afraid in what this church is doing and what I can contribute. Um, that's about it. Thank you. So I, I have to just say that um, in my experience, Kate has jumped into the deep end. She's already a wonderful contributor and readers and seekers, and she's going to be little just soon. So here we go. So today we make a covenant with one another. Kate, you make promises to us before God so that we know we can count on you. And we make promises to you before God so that you can depend on us through good times and bad times. And so we ask, well, I'm going to ask you some questions. Do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, say I do. Do you promise to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of Jesus, to resist oppression and evil, to show love in the face of injustice, and to be a witness to the healing ministry and the loving message of Jesus Christ as you are able? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Do you promise, according to the grace given you, to grow in your faith, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's work in all the world. If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in worship and 
and listening in the work of this local church as it serves this community and the world? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. And now I turn to the congregation. Do you promise, O oh people of Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ, to help Kate find her place in the body of Christ, to pray with and for her, to welcome her fully in holy friendship, to be angels for her in times of distress, and servants to her in times of need? If so, please answer, we promise with the help of God. We promise with the help of God. Let us, the members and friends of Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. And that welcome is printed in bold in the bulletin, and we can say it together. We welcome you with joy in the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love, and be witnesses of a Christ who is alive and well at work in the world. Loving God, give to these your children strength for life's journey, courage in time of suffering, the comfort of faith, love that cannot die laughter in the company of friends, and the joy of new love. Through Jesus Christ, who makes us one. Amen. Amen. And I say, welcome, Sister Kate. <laughs> what a joy. So I do have, oh, we have a hymn. We do have a hymn, which is also on the insert um, and if you could please rise as you are able, and we will sing it together.
organizations we support in our community. Um, so please get your coffee and your snacks and join us in the fireside room. And, uh, and I want to say um, welcome to uh, Yolanda, first time in the fire this morning, and Bob, who has been coming. And I'm going to away, which has been a good choir. But I also would like to um, issue a general invitation for those interested in being in the choir and those of you in the choir came who may not know that there is a um, sort of open house, there's a social, choir social at Missy MacArthur's next week, the 17th. What time? Four, 4.30. Four. At 4 o'clock. Um, if you, and we will get together and Lizzie will bring music and we will, and everyone is asked to bring, it's, we call it wine and cheese, but whatever your iteration of that is, bring it and we will sing together and um, Lizzie will bring some music and we will have some social time together. So I just wanted to lift that up. And uh, I, again, am very delighted to have the choir up in the morning. And on that note, I send you forth. Remember that you are called to love God with all that you are, to love yourself with all that you are, and to love your neighbor with all that you are, and that God has declared your full self to be very good. Go forth and be loved in the world. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. You are free. And let us gather in our beautiful circle as we send one another out into the week.